Hello, and thank you for joining the first of our LinkedIn Live sessions where we will be exploring how data and analytics are influencing a wide range of industries. So my name is Jeremy Petranka. I am the Associate Dean of the Quantitative Management Programs at Duke University's Fuqua School of Business. So our Masters of Quantitative Management Programs are designed to bridge the gap between more modern data science tools and the specific strategic and operational needs of businesses. And it's with that lens that we are extremely excited to kick things off today by focusing specifically on how data is being used in the sports industry. We could not be luckier to be joined by Kelsey McDonald, who is a 2018 graduate from our MCOM program. Kelsey's career, um, I'm not going to do it justice, but deeply immersed in the world of sports analytics. Currently, she is the Director of Ticketing Strategy and Pricing Analytics for the Brooklyn Nets at BSC Global. She also supports other Barclays Center events like the New York Liberty Games. She's going to talk more about it today, but at a high level, her team is responsible for making dynamic pricing decisions, forecasting demand, building customer retention models, and pretty much being the trusted source of data uh, for anything ticketing throughout the organization. Prior to this role, she was a project manager at the NBA corporate office where she focused on finding ways to share advanced uh, player stats with fans all over the world. And she got her start in industry in Boston working as a data scientist with the Kraft Analytics Group. And with that, Kelsey, thank you so much for being with us today. Of course. Thank you for having me, Jeremy. I feel like I'm back in school. I'm all nervous. I'm like, oh, it's good. Nice to see you. I think you have the upper hand on this one, so you're good. <laughs> All right, so let's jump in. I think when most people think sports analytics, what they generally kind of think about is Moneyball. They start thinking about performance analytics on how to use data to really make team and individual players better. And it feels like it was about 20 to 30 years ago when this really started becoming you know, a thing. It started getting into both professional team psyches, but also kind of fan psyches. Can you give us kind of the high level view of how that's evolved since then and kind of where we are now? Yes, for sure. So yeah, Moneyball, you really can't talk about sports analytics without mentioning Brad Pitt, Jonah Hill, who knew they <laughs> would motivate an entire you know, generation of statisticians. But we'll talk about it briefly. Um, I'm on the business side now, but like you said, at the league, I was dealing with more player statistics. So what we do now is much more detailed than what you know they had to do when they were first trying to introduce sports analytics as a topic or as a, even a field that people could get into. So you know you have your Bill James and your Dean Olivers of the world. They were kind of the pioneers that really did the hard work in the sense of convincing front offices that they need to use analytics and they need to use stats beyond just the box score or run scored to actually analyze players, especially when it comes to comparing players and seeing who's more effective in different you know lineups and situations and things like that. So I would consider that kind of the initial revolution where it was really game changing for every single team to realize that they need to have someone, at least one person in the front office, whether it's on the coaching staff or someone that travels with the team, actually dedicated to data and stats. And to kind of spin that into what's going on now, every team for the most part has at least one person, like I said. But now people are getting so detailed to where they have someone who is focused on player health specifically or you know research and development in really specific fields so it's not to say that there's still tons to learn you know with tracking data we haven't really even scratched the surface in basketball in terms of how to really quantify defense and things like that so tons of room to grow but every change now will be much more minor compared to the initial kind of revolution of we should talk about points and by possession you know points per possession instead of points per game to really understand how someone is more impactful than another player. So yes, big, big changes will continue to happen, especially with new data sources, but that's kind of my spiel on Moneyball. Is it, is it pretty much the case that every professional team is doing kind of performance analytics? And if so, have you started seeing it come down into, into the college level and maybe all the way down to high school, or is it still primarily the, the domain of professional? I would say definitely still primarily professional. Um, and I, I would argue that every single team has at least one person, you know, maybe not a whole entire team, but it's very common now. It would be uncommon to not have someone sitting in that seat, which is pretty wild to think even five years ago when I was first trying to get into the field that it was not that way, uh, especially in teams, you know, like the NFL, they still didn't fully have their own internal teams built out. So yeah, it's, I would say in terms of college and high school, uh, the big 
especially I'm, I'm more basketball focused here, but we don't have tracking data in, you know, set up in high school and college arenas. It's a pretty expensive equipment to have all the different cameras uh, set up. So it's not that they, they're still trying to use analytics and building out teams to analyze different player video. It's just not quite as easy because not everything is captured. You have to do it all manually for in most places. So uh, they still try though. So I think kind of turning away from, from the performance analytics, my feel is it would surprise most people to know how much kind of data science and using data is used, especially at the professional level inside of organizations beyond just the athletic side and really more and more throughout the organization. Can you give an idea of how, and I think your team obviously is, is focused on that side of things. Can you give an idea at the broad level how it's being used and why it feels like more and more this is becoming just a, a way you need to do business at that level? Yeah, definitely. So obviously I'm, I'm very pro business side analytics. Uh, I think we have about, I would say 20, 20 people, maybe 25, including interns and part-time employees in between our team, which is you know the ticket analytics and pricing side. And then we also have a really well built out business intelligence side of things where they deal with a lot of similar data, but they're more focused on the customer journey and uh, you know everything Salesforce and really helping the sales reps where we're a bit more revenue ticketing side. Uh, but between our two teams, we have 20 data scientists, some you know more data engineers, some more data analysts, BI analysts, but that's a pretty built out team. You know, I, I wouldn't I don't think any front office in terms of sports has 20 people purely dedicated to data. Um, and, you know, there could be a lot of reasons for that. It's it's easier to justify when we're directly, you know, talking about revenue and when our boss's boss wants to know how much we made at a game, they, they need, you know, the tablet dashboards that our great team has built out um, to be updated, you know, pretty much real time. So I think, and we'll talk more about the details, but things like retention models, they are pretty common in a lot of industries, obviously, like when we learned it, it at the Duke program and we were talking about, I want to say cell phone companies or something, like sure models are needed everywhere. But especially in our industry where we're talking about season ticket members, they have every single year the option to renew or the option to leave. So we can very easily analyze that behavior and you know we'll get into the details of what all goes into that. But I would say that almost every team has some version of a retention model. Which is pretty amazing to think because you know again five ten years ago that was that was groundbreaking stuff so now we just get to kind of grow on that and evolve and model even more things i blame myself i admittedly did not realize your team was that big that's not just sports organizations that's larger than a lot of very large you know fortune 500 in terms of the core uh a analytics team that's, mm -hmm. that's incredible so i think you mentioned part of that is this world of the pricing side of things. And this is one where sports and entertainment more broadly, there's a very specific uh, similarity to pricing airline tickets and pricing hotels. At least that's the feel in the sense that you have a set number of seats and you'd like those seats to be filled. Um, so you're in a game where you're almost going for the Goldilocks price that, that you want it to be just right. You want it high enough so that you're making as much revenue as possible, but you don't want it too high such that you have empty seats. And, and my feel is, especially in your domain, where how the team does throughout the year, who they're playing on any given night, whether they're playing on a weekend or a weekday, there's so much that goes into trying to figure out what pricing looks like before we get into some of the, the more detailed pieces on how you think about pricing and use data. Can you give the, the kind of high level piece on how you would even start to start thinking about that question given so many things moving at once? Yes, so because of how volatile the individual ticket market can be, which you're talking about all these factors of what players are in, what's going on in the news, all those things. That's why we really do want to rely on our season ticket member base so in most arenas and stadiums, you aim to have at least half, if not closer to three quarters, 75, 80% of your stadium, arena, whatever it is, of your venue already signed on before the season even starts. So those are your season ticket holders, whether they bought the whole season, half, some type of a plan. Uh, that, that really protects you from the fear of one of your stars getting hurt or leaving or something like that. And that's why when you ask the Goldilocks question, which I, I like thinking of it in that way, um, in terms of maximizing revenue, obviously we want to bring in as much revenue as we can. But especially for us, having just moved, you know, we were in New Jersey a decade ago, and now we're kind of trying to 
rebuild a fan base here in Brooklyn, um, that's really tough because we we need to have pricing that's fair to get the people that actually want to be in the arena here while also keeping, obviously, ownership and people paying the bills, you know, making money and, and having that revenue. So I can go into a quick example of how we try to find the, the Goldilocks price, knowing that it's very elusive and, and likely will never be exact. But uh, we have sales data, obviously, so we can see that your seat sold for $100, uh, you know, two days before the game to, let's say, the Warriors. And then I can also see that someone posted a seat very similar to that, maybe right next to it, for $200 on the secondary market, and it didn't sell at all. So you could argue that the $100 could be too low of a price, right? Maybe they're willing to go 150 180 but we know that 200 was too high. So that's a very, you know, uh, first of all, cheap example. I don't know that we had any tickets quite that low for the Warriors, but, you know, we, we also had um, – that's an example of at a very small scale how you can try to find and what our whole pricing team's job is just to try to find that in-between sweet spot. So – I actually love to go more into pricing, partially because I think a lot of people that they understand it, you know, if they've ever flown on a plane, if they've ever got a hotel room, they understand this idea of dynamic pricing that mm -hmm. it can change from day to day. Um, again, with, with tickets and with sporting events, I think they understand that. But a lot of the, I don't know if magic's the right word, <laughs> the art and the science behind that, I think people don't quite have, have a grasp on it. It almost feels, you know, why it's moving. They can't quite tell. So I'd love to ask you a few uh, a few specific questions on how you think about this, how your team approaches it. And somewhat on the broad, some of these are going to be really broad to any kind of dynamic pricing scenario. Some uh, specifically hit on the idiosyncrasies of a, a an industry where you have a fan base, mm -hmm. and and which is very different than you know staying at a hotel. You know, I'm not right. going to go out and wear. A particular hotel lines at Jersey <laughs> out to the park <laughs> on, on a Sunday. So I um, want to dig into some of those, and, and especially as you're thinking about there's the data science side of things, so the straight science part. Mm -hmm. There is the customer loyalty side. There's kind of the softer marketing and, and how you kind of, to some degree, blend that together, or at least think about it. Yep. So the first kind of specific place I want to dive into is, and you mentioned it, the season ticket holders versus the individual. So it definitely feels like, and it almost has to be, there's an interplay between these. That as you're setting the season price, you are also thinking about, I would imagine, what the individual sales would be, but then vice versa, the individual sales will inform you in terms of your season prices. Can yes. you give an idea of, of what that, uh, in some ways, what comes first, the chicken or the egg, but how you kind of think about those in combination? Yes, absolutely. So perfect timing in terms of year. We we just kind of finalized our season ticket member pricing and we're going out with renewals very soon here, which is pretty wild to think we're about halfway through the current season and we're already on sale with next season. So that I guess that's your chicken or your egg. That, that comes first. Season ticket pricing always comes first. Uh, the dates I'm going to share are going to be basketball specific, but every every sport operates on kind of a similar cycle, as far as I know anyways. So we... Think about, you know, it already started probably back around Thanksgiving. We start looking at, okay, we've had a handful of games, like 10, I think we had about 10 or 15 games at that point. So we start saying, how well are these games selling? What's happening on the secondary market? Because a lot of times we use that as our understanding of what demand is, what people are willing to pay. Because um, otherwise it's just prices we already set. So we don't want to bias ourselves too much in that way. But we, we look and we see how tickets are selling in different locations and you pick one price for, for each seat. So you're not looking at, you know, for the Warriors, we're going to price it at this. And for the Pistons, we're going to price it here. We pick one number, and that is the season ticket deal that you get for if you buy now. Um, then when the season or when the schedule comes out in August, that's when we start to have a tiering model. So we have a good team of data scientists here, and they collect all kinds of data. So once our schedule is released and we know we're playing, again, the Warriors on – a Wednesday and it's in December, we take all these different factors to say, okay, how many stars do they have on their team? Uh, what day of the week is it? How, uh, what's their current record? What are, what are Vegas odds predicting the record to be? Like all kinds of factors that go into what type of game this should be. Is it one of our highest tiered opponents? Is it one of our lower tiered opponents? And then from there, you kind of split up what you think your individual price will be. And that's what we call the variable price. And with dynamic pricing, you don't have to sell 
every single ticket at that price, right? Because as time goes and, and inventory changes, you change that price. But the idea is that every game, the variable price will add up to this season price that we set today. So it's pretty wild to think that there's about six months in between when you set season tickets to when you set individual tickets, but that's kind of the, the rough timeline how that goes. And that, that doesn't even add the complexity of everything you said is true for specific parts of the stadium. Right. You're, you're doing that for different seats, different levels throughout the entire, as you're setting the individual ones. Right. How, how and, and if, if you can't get into the details, I understand, how refined are you cutting? Is it, does it tend to be, you know, this section of, of stadium, this section, or is it even more specific than that? So I believe this is public, so our, our pricing is public. But uh -oh. yes, we have, we have a lot, let's say. We have uh, currently, I believe, over 100 price points if you cut it in different types of ways. Um, something we, a lot of teams do is price uh, by the aisle. So if you're sitting on an aisle seat, that's actually a little bit more expensive than if you sit on the third seat over. Um, a lot of people price the front rows differently, and we do in certain locations where we see that there is a value you know, where the front row is valued more. So obviously the, the easiest example is you think courtside, right? I'd rather be right courtside than the row right behind courtside. So obviously that's an easy one. But once you get into the upper bowl, sometimes it's actually the first two rows that people value at, you know, you're a little bit closer. You can really kind of lean over and see um, versus once you get into 12th, 13th, 14th row up in the upper bowl, it, they're all pretty comparable uh, from what we've seen anyways. So those are the different types of cuts. And the one, the one only kind of caveat would be um, for national TV games, they like to bring, you know, the big national TV cameras that cut out a, a big chunk of seats. So you also have to consider those things. You can't sell those tickets for a full season price. So maybe you really, you know, ramp up the prices on different games. And there's all kinds of that I'm still getting to know, you know, because I, I just joined here less than a year ago. So I'm still getting through my first season of trying to understand, wait, why don't we sell those seats again? Because there's the... There's one where basically if you both if you sell both seats, their knees will be touching because they're too like catty cornered to each other. So there's tons of fun little caveats like that that uh, you really have to get to know before you can even begin to start trying to price appropriately. I, I can't imagine the complexity that some of the, the camera thing never had occurred to me that they actually removed seats for that. Me um, neither till this year. So that was a fun, <laughs> fun realization. Do you ever, it, it, and, and sorry to spring this on you, um, have you ever experienced a situation where someone, not on the data science side, some of the more, you know, on the more fan facing side comes to you and say, you know, they disagree with, with your, so for instance, when you say, you know, aisles can go more, and I, I, I think I would, you know, I think a lot of people would agree with that, but for instance, someone comes to you and says, actually, I don't know. I, I don't think people actually like aisles. Mm. Does that ever happen? And if so, how do, you know, how do you approach that? Uh, definitely, yes. And with the aisle seat, I think anxious people like the aisle seat more. So that's, that's my theory there. We haven't tested that one with data yet. But um, no, I think, so for when we, you know, before we do pricing, we work very closely with the sales team. So we kind of collect the data and decide that we think this should be the initial pricing. But then the sales reps and the sales leaders are the ones who are actually having those conversations with people every day. So they know that, yeah, while certain locations are selling really well on the secondary, that could be skewed because they, you know, it's a small number of seats. They sold the biggest games and the rest of the games, there's no demand there at all. So um, having that quantity or the qualitative to add into the quantitative is very, very important. Um, in terms of opinions, in terms of, you know, if, if they don't have qualitative data to back it up, then we often lean on the, you know, the numbers because we don't know. If we don't know what aisle seats are worth, then sometimes we win those battles, sometimes we don't. Um, but I would say our, we're lucky to work in an organization that's very data focused. Like I said, I mean, we have a team of 20 plus, so it's, uh, we don't have too many fights like that. And our CEO loves data. So he's very, you know, he, he actually will question decisions if they're not data backed, you know, he'll say, why do you think that if we don't have anything to prove it? So he's very good about that. That's incredible. Um, yeah. as you're, as you're, doing that partially as you're not having fights but as you're having these conversations but especially as it moves more from season tickets to the individual tickets to actually mm -hmm. the season is going on and so you're actually you're actually approaching a game how often do you 
I don't know if change is the right word. Are you constantly looking at, well, what should the price of the game for the remaining tickets be one week out, a few days out, especially when things, for instance, in the news come out? So, you know, we mentioned Golden State. If, if Steph Curry has an injury and so suddenly it turns out that he's not going to be able to play that night, I would mm-hmm. imagine that that would affect um, interest in the game. Are you looking at it at that level of, of granularity? Yes. So we have a pricing analyst dedicated to just that. And this will be my, my shameless plug for we are growing our pricing team. So if you're interested in watching, please reach out to me after because she she works hard every day keeping track of these types of things. And she's pretty much doing it. You know, we have help from uh, our bosses and, and other people. But it, it's a lot of work because not only do you have to keep up with the news to say, OK, Steph went from injured to pro- questionable to now probable. You know, you have to track all of that. But They make uh, leading up to the game, like the day of a game or the day before there are we're in constant communication with uh, our third party group that does some of our posting on multiple platforms. We have an open distribution partner. And so they're constantly in communication to say, okay, let's increase these tickets here because they're not trending the way we thought they would. And let's decrease seats over here. And okay, actually, can you give us those back? We have an internal deal that we, we need to do here. So uh, it's even without major news changes, it's constant movement on the day, the days leading up to a game. And then I will just add one more thing. That's why our season ticket members are so important because they lock in today and they have no idea what's going to happen, you know, in December. So they might be trying to resell their tickets if something like that comes out, which maybe will flood the market a bit and cause prices to drop. But the the goal would be to not lower prices as best we can when we get closer to the game, because the whole mentality that we're trying to bring and change is that we want to reward people for buying early so our season ticket holders are buying now we want to reward people for buying in bulk that's why our group tickets are a little bit cheaper than individual tickets because you have to buy at least 10 you know little things like that to try to almost teach people and our fans to not try to go online you know 12 hours before the game to get the best price you should try to do that 12 weeks before the game to get the best price so you know it's a slow shift because it didn't used to always be this way but that's the hope is that we're, we have a safe enough base to where terrible news like that doesn't totally destroy your sales. So again, not, not to do a shameless plug for your team, but it, it's sounding like that this war your team in more general, it, it sounds like you have this slow cycle happening with the season ticket and mm-hmm. this really ultimately hyper fast cycle happening. So such that the entire, even beyond the season, it feels like a very, I don't want to say energized place to work. <laughs> but yes, sell the culture. It's very <laughs> what is it? fast paced. You got to be quick on your feet, the whole thing. Yeah, no, it's it's very, it's very lively. Um, we were in office four days a week, but it's a great place to be in office because you have, you know, their basketball hoops, ping pong tables, the whole thing. Um, but yeah, no, it's very fast paced. Do you ever have, and this is kind of more for dynamic pricing in general, do you ever have a down season for you or is it always... You know, you'll just move to the slower cycles. Jeremy, I would love to know when the down cycle is because I've been <laughs> kind of told, oh, this is our busy season. This is our busy season since I got here in April. So uh, I have a feeling no. The answer is no. Um, I think we had a slow week two weeks ago. And then it, I think the summer <laughs> is okay. But yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry, you, missed, you missed your slow season two weeks ago. I apologize. Yep, yep, that was it. That was the one. All right, so you mentioned something, and I actually like to, to get your thoughts on it more, the open distribution model. So more broadly, mm-hmm. I want to talk about ticket resale. Because this is one where, you know, we talked about there's some similarities in dynamic pricing with, with airplanes and with hotels. This is a very different thing. When you're talking about sports and entertainment, people can resell their tickets. You can't go and resell. You, know, you can't get a hotel room and then resell it to somebody else that right. doesn't have your ID. So, you know, you mentioned that the open distribution is, is part of your model. Um, and recently, especially in the entertainment and music industry, there's been some um, sentiment, <laughs> is a good way to put it, about resale. And I imagine that for you, there, there's a trade-off. And I'd love to get your thoughts. On one hand, ticket resale, it, as it always can in any industry and for any type of good, it, it gets more people selling it. It makes it easier for, for fans to actually find places to buy it. But on the flip side, you do start having more uncertainty in terms of where the prices end up, who end up, who ends up with the tickets, kind mm-hmm. of whether there's any of that negative feedback. How do you think about it as an organization? Uh, so 
I like where you were going with it. There's different connotations with resale, right? There, some people are, you know, I won't say pro or against brokers, but basically our main goal, again, is to have as many fans in the building as possible. So we want to get tickets to the people that want to be there at the best price possible. That being said, though, with, you know, a team, you have one primary ticket partner. So we can distribute tickets through that one platform, which is where having a partner, and I say partner instead of, you know, vendor or broker, because it is a partnership with this company, but we work with them to distribute fairly priced tickets across all platforms. And that's the group that we're in constant communication with as we're leading up to the game so that we have a similar strategy as well so that, you know, their prices aren't way cheaper or way more expensive than ours. And um, that we're all kind of aligned in how we do that because that helps us reach the goal of if you're a a strictly vivid seats buyer, I want to make sure that you see that we have a ticket available in your price range. Um, But you know, especially with things like group tickets where we offer them at a discount and you're really not supposed to resell those tickets. Uh, it's kind of tough because for as much data as we have, there are still obviously gaps. So um, because of the way our platform set up, if you resell a ticket on a different platform, then we see that as a transfer. So for all I know, you transferred it to your friend and you guys, you know, exchange money on Venmo or whatever it is. Um, or you didn't resell it, you just transferred it because you bought a bunch for your company. Like, let's say you're taking Duke out for a game, you buy a bunch and you distribute them, and we wouldn't want to flag you as a broker for that behavior. So it is tricky because, you know, you can look at who's attending their tickets, you can look at who's moving their tickets, and that can get you close. But this is where you really rely on the conversations that sales reps are having and understanding how certain fans are using their tickets. Um, And again, going back to wanting as many season tickets as we can because, they have to turn in uh, proof of residency, basically. So I'm not sure it doesn't have to just be New York, obviously, but I'm not sure what the wide range of, you know, locations that that we accept there, but they want to make sure you're not buying tickets from, you know, somewhere on the West Coast where there's no way you're coming to 43 games. Um, So we have things in place. That's definitely an area that every part of our company is really focused on getting better at identifying brokers. So I had a feeling this was going to happen, that I've gotten through maybe 20% of the questions. <laughs> yeah, want... it's already, look at that. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I, I've always found that, that talking to you about this, I, yes, that could be an hours long conversation. However, we promised that we would try to keep this <laughs> to our allotted time. So let me actually jump to the kind of forward looking question. Um, just from what you've said, not just in the last you know 20 years, in the last five years, mm-hmm. the industry, and again, the size of your team, I would not have predicted that where this was five years ago. Mm-hmm. Where do you see sports analytics moving in the next 10 to 20 years? Yes, uh, hopefully still growing. I, I, you know, obviously, I think every new data source you get will kind of change the whole landscape. So I just finished uh, Seth's book, The Midrange Theory, and in that he talks about how if we can start collecting audio on how players talk to each other throughout a game or coaches, then maybe we can get a better feel for if they're good at defense, if they're a good teammate. And it got me thinking about if we had audio in arenas, right? Like I know that they have the clap meter whatever, tracking how loud the arena is, but maybe a more accurate thing to actually say, you know, this section is your most loyal fans because they are the loudest no matter what's going on in the game or different pieces like that. Um, I always thought it would be interesting to have an indicator on your seats so that if you stand up, we know, you know, how much time you're actually spending sitting as opposed to maybe you jump up every time there's anything that happens, every dunk, or maybe you leave to go eat food for, you know, a whole quarter, different things like that. Um, So maybe more in arena tracking, I think would be really interesting outside of just buying behaviors. Uh, I know when we were talking earlier, we were talking a little bit about facial recognition. Uh, You could use that for a lot of things, but I think it'd be interesting to use it to see how excited a fan is or how engaged they are in in different spots too. So things like that, the more data we can collect, the more interesting our projects become. So selfishly, that's where I hope it goes. So Kelsey, again, I could, I could talk to you about this for hours, but we can't. So I will just sincerely thank you for being a part of this. Um, You, you were part of the very first class of MQM and, and being the first, you set us on a really amazing path. I think the same, I feel the same way on this, Um, you being the first for this series. Thank you. Um, Thank you. 
it was a ton of fun. And I will say we have two fellow MQMers uh, at BSC with us now. So it's it's clearly a good program for what we're trying to do here. So thank you for sending it up. Thank you for that plug. Uh, for everyone watching that are interested in this series going forward, the next one is going to be on Thursday, February 23rd. And this one, pretty uh, far removed from sports analytics, it's actually a discussion of how analytics and machine learning are allowing researchers to study genomes. So really the, the genetic world. And my guest is gonna be Dr. Carrie Ann Smith, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Genetics at UNC Chapel Hill and a Fuqua alum. Also, please follow Fuqua on LinkedIn to stay in the loop about these conversations, but also our series featuring faculty members and insights from their research.